June 13th, 1996. Idaho Falls, Idaho. An 18 year old high school graduate who had recently moved into their own apartments in the town was scheduled to start her shift at a local cosmetics store at 7 a.m. But the 18 year old failed to show up for work. Her employer decided to try to ring her up to see why she hadn't come to work that day, thinking she might be ill or had some kind of a family emergency. Though her employer's calls went straight to voicemail. She didn't pick up. Two of the people that she works with, who she was also friends with, concerned for the 18 year old, drove over to her apartment to check on her. When they arrived, her front door was ajar and inside, they discovered a scene from their darkest nightmares. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Angie Ray Dodge was born on Wednesday the 21st of December 1977 in Vancouver, Washington to her parents Jack and Carol Dodge. Angie was Jack and Carol's first daughter and fourth child, with Angie's older siblings all being boys. According to her family, she was a gifted child with amazing intelligence and a great enthusiasm for life. She was the kind of person that can make you smile on the darkest of days. Angie initially began her educational career at preschool in San Diego, California, following which her family moved to Idaho Falls, Idaho, where Angie would complete her studies at grade school, junior high, and then finally high school in the town. Throughout her years at high school, and as a testament to Angie's good nature and enthusiasm, Angie tutored a multitude of different children in the subjects of mathematics and English. She used her intelligence and compassion to aid the children she tutored, and it paid off. She was extremely gifted and highly praised by the parents of those she tutored. Ultimately, Angie graduated from high school with honours and decided to continue her studies at university. Though, after studying for a short while, Angie decided that university wasn't right for her at that point in her life, and so she returned to Idaho Falls. Angie had a love for nature and deeply appreciated the beauty of the world around her. She was the kind of person who loved camping with her family. She loved the adventure and the beautiful memories it created for her and her loved ones. Even when the spots that they had chosen to camp in had been basic, Angie always found a way to have fun. On one occasion, at a particularly primitive campsite, Angie managed to find water near the campsite and started a water fight with her family, cousins and friends that had gone on the camping trip. She was also one to fully embrace and celebrate the Christmas holidays, and as her birthday was just days before Christmas, her family always had one massive combined family Christmas party to celebrate both occasions. Angie was known to handcraft Christmas necklaces with ribbons and bells, which she would hand out to all those in attendance of the Christmas party, ensuring everybody had one and even bringing extras just in case there were any plus ones. Angie's first car was nicknamed the boat by her friends and family. And astonishingly, she always managed to fit several friends inside the boat and see how far they could go on just a few gallons of gas before running out. The boats would constantly be covered in mud and the inside had food wrappers that were inches deep. The boats, more often than not, looked as if it had been in some kind of demolition derby. Just a few months prior to June of 1996, Angie said goodbye to her first car, the boat, and traded it in for a brand new Chevy. She'd also found work at a cosmetic supply store, and it hadn't been long after starting there that she made friends with her co-workers. Though, when she failed to show up for work at 7am on Thursday the 13th of June 1996, her co-workers grew concerned. It wasn't like Angie to not show up to her shift without at least calling ahead beforehand to let somebody know. And as she wasn't picking up the phone, 
two of her co-workers decided to drive over to her apartment to check on her. The two co-workers arrived at around 11am that morning and immediately noticed that the front door to her apartment was ajar. And so the two co-workers cautiously entered her apartment. Nothing immediately seemed out of place. The apartment was clean and undisturbed. That was until they got to Angie's bedroom. Angie was in the bedroom, semi-nude, covered in blood, and wasn't moving. The two co-workers immediately contacted the police. Idaho Falls Police Department immediately dispatched officers to Angie's apartment, responding to the 911 call. The officers entered Angie's bedroom and found her body laying in the bedroom next to the bed with her throat slashed. Angie had further sustained numerous stab wounds to her chest and hands. The wounds to her hands were consistent with that of a person trying to defend themselves. Her blue sweatpants had also been pulled down to expose her, and her purple t-shirt had further been pulled up, which is indicative of some form of sexual assault. Blood splatters were found on the wall near to her body, indicating that she had been killed in the same location she had been found. It's important to note that despite there being such an extensive crime scene, the detectives only took a handful of photographs. Now this is strange as it would have been standard for police investigations into homicides to take hundreds if not thousands of photographs of a crime scene, not just a handful. Further, the photographs that were taken did not include a ruler or identifying placard which are vital pieces of information in allowing a courtroom to understand the scale and relevance of the photographs. It seems as if the detectives simply couldn't be bothered to follow the standard practice of police investigations. Despite this, the investigators concluded from the crime scene that there had likely been just a single perpetrator. There were signs of a struggle. Circular smudges on the wall above and behind Angie's head where she was found were consistent with that of someone trying to fight their attacker off, and her defensive wounds to her hands further showed that she put up a fight. If there had been multiple attackers, she would likely have been restrained in some way during the attack, which would have likely eliminated defensive wounds of that kind. As a result of Angie being found semi-nude, the detectives collected samples from Angie's body for a rape kit and further collected samples of bodily fluids from the scene. It is important to note that even though Angie's clothes had been semi-removed, it wasn't believed that she had actually been the victim of penile slash vaginal rape. Her sweatpants had only been pulled down and not removed, which would have made it extremely difficult for such a rape to occur. Though, semen was found and recovered from Angie's thigh and from the waistband of her sweatpants, which indicated that her attacker likely pledged himself either during or following the murder. But who had done this to Angie, and why? The detectives immediately began to interview Angie's family and friends, and it was from those interviews that the detectives learned that Angie had last been seen alive at about 12.20am on the 13th of June by friends who had been visiting her, just 11 hours before she would be found murdered by her co-workers. The detectives further learned that Angie had been part of a group of friends that spent a lot of their time hanging out by Snake River, which is a river that runs through Idaho Falls. Members of that friend group were subsequently brought in for questioning, including a 19-year-old called Chris Tapp. Chris Tapp had been born and raised in Idaho Falls and had been in the friend group with Angie for a while, though they weren't particularly close. The investigators asked Chris whether he could give a voluntary statement answering questions about who Angie interacted with at the Snake River. Chris informed the detectives that he'd never actually been to Angie's apartment, after all they weren't all that close. Along with dozens of other teenage boys and young men, Chris voluntarily gave a blood sample to the authorities to be used in any DNA comparisons. And in late 1996, Chris and all of the other men were excluded as the source of the semen found at the crime scene. The police had hit a dead end. They didn't have any more leads and no answers as to who might have done this and why. Six months had passed since Angie's murder and the police had made no further progress than they had on day one. That was until the 6th of January 1997 when the detectives received word that one of the teenagers that hung out with Angie at the Snake River had been arrested on an unrelated rape charge in Nevada. Had this teenager been the perpetrator all along? The teenager was called Benjamin Hobbs, and he quickly became the sole focus of the investigations. The detectives took this lead and ran with it, focusing their questioning on Benjamin's friends in the hopes that they might give them evidence incriminating him. 
This was completely despite the fact that there was no evidence at all that linked Benjamin Hobbs or any of his friends to the actual crime, besides being friends with Angie. Regardless, the police dropped by Christopher Tabb's house, who they had actually already excluded via DNA evidence earlier on, and brought him down to the police station. Their reasoning for this was that if his friend Benjamin had been involved in an alleged rape case, Chris must also have morals aligned in that way, and maybe he knew more than he was letting on. Maybe he knew that Benjamin had murdered Angie. Maybe he was involved. And so, on the 7th of January 1997, the police interviewed Chris Tapp. And Chris remained fully cooperative and denied any knowledge or involvement in the murder of Angie Dodge. But the police continued to pressure Chris, trying to get him to provide evidence against Benjamin. The investigators lied to Chris, telling him that it looked as if he had been involved in Angie's murder, despite them not having any evidence whatsoever connecting him, Chris, to the crime. Notably, when Chris would deny knowing anything about Angie's murder, the detectives threatened him by saying that he'll, quote, fry, meaning he's going to get the death sentence. Now, it is important to note that these detectives conducting this interview did so with the direction and consent of their chief, these weren't some rogue officers. Naturally, Chris's mother rushed to defend her son and tried to put a stop to the interrogations, but was told by the chief of police to let the interrogations continue. And so, over the course of the following three weeks, between the 7th of January 1997 and the 1st of February 1997, Chris Tapp was subjected to a total of nine interrogations and seven misconducted polygraph examinations. Each interrogation lasted hours, and the pressure and questioning even continued during supposed breaks. They lied to Chris, threatened him with a death penalty, and refused to let him take real breaks from the interrogations, even when Chris grew extremely exhausted and sobbed as he begged for a break. The police relied on non-existent, culpable knowledge as the basis of their evidence. Culpable knowledge being information about a crime, a crime scene and modus operandi of the killer or killers that would only have been known by the killer or killers and the police at the time, something that nobody else would have known. And it was on the basis of culpable knowledge that Chris Tapp was arrested and charged as an accessory to Angie Dodge's murder. Let's take a look at the alleged culpable evidence. The lead detective in this case alleged that Christopher Tapp knew minute details of the crime scene, including, quote, the color of the victim's clothes, the position of the victim's clothes, how many times she was stabbed. However, when the recordings of the interrogations were later examined, that statement is categorically false. Christopher Tapp never knew and never provided any of this information correctly to the detectives. He was manipulated, pressured and coerced into giving a confession full of incorrect and contradictory details. Chris was emotionally broken by the interrogators and had become willing to say anything to get it to stop. During these interrogations, Chris claims that Angie's clothing had been red, then black, then grey and then blue. Each time he was wrong in his claims. Chris further claims that Angie's sweatpants had been completely removed from one leg while remaining on the other, which is false. Angie's sweatpants had been found still fully on both legs and pulled down less than three inches below her pubic. Further, Chris completely failed to tell the detectives the correct number of times that Angie had been stabbed. The autopsy report concluded that Angie had been stabbed approximately 16 times, but Christopher Wood, at various different points in the interrogations, claimed that Angie had only been stabbed once, then later he claimed twice, then three times, all incorrect and obvious guesses. He was also unable to provide accurate information as to where Angie had sustained these stab wounds. Thus, it is obviously immoral to claim that Christopher Tapp knew how many times Angie had been stabbed, but not even the coroner could accurately determine that number, giving only an approximate. Let's explore the methods in which the investigators coached Chris into giving a confession. The methods used to elicit the correct answers from Chris were simple but undeniably effective, yet the antithesis of how fact-finding interviews should be conducted. One of these methods, a simple and effective method, used to obtain the response they wanted from Chris was just to ask him the same question over and over again, until Chris guessed the correct answer. The investigators further communicated with Chris via verbal and non-verbal actions, 
in such a way that Chris knew whether the answer he was giving had been what they wanted or not. One way of signaling to Chris that he'd gotten an answer wrong was to simply correct him. In one interrogation, the detectives asked Chris when Benjamin came home, to which Chris replied by responding, quote, later that evening. But the detective interrupted Chris saying, quote, wait a minute, okay. Angie was murdered sometime during the night, okay? You woke up the next morning, right? Chris said yes, and then the detective asked him again when Benjamin came home, to which Chris replied by saying sometime the next day. This method of manipulating Chris into confessing being an accomplice in Angie's murder is downright disgusting. Whether the police department had been under pressure to close that case or not, they had been trusted by the community they served to find true justice. Another way in which the detectives let Chris know that he'd given a wrong answer was to simply stare at him in silence after he'd given the wrong answer. As the interrogations progressed, Chris picked up on these signals given by the police. On one occasion, when asked to identify the rooms in Angie's apartment and what type of furniture was in the room where she was murdered, Christopher Tapp said, a sofa. Chris immediately looks at the detective. The detective stares back at Chris without changing expression or answering. Chris knew he needed to keep guessing. Chris, nah, I'm thinking a futon. Or maybe a futon? Again, Chris pauses and stares at his interrogator. The detective continues to stare back at Chris, expressionless and silent. Chris dropped his head into his hands, mumbling in apparent frustration. The detective then immediately changed the topic of the interrogation. And every time that Chris guessed an answer correctly, the detectives would repeat his answer and ask specific follow-up questions based on his correct guess. Quote, During the interrogation of January 17th, Chris gave an answer to an oft-repeated and never correctly answered question regarding what Angie was wearing the night she died. Chris gave an answer that appeared to be in the form of a question. Quote, the only thing that half comes to mind was a t-shirt and some sweats. For the first time, he had provided the right answer. This was not evidence of culpable knowledge. Angie had been a friend of Chris's for some time, and she was known to frequently wear sweats casually. Chris had undoubtedly seen her in the sweats. The detective, rather than staring silently at Chris, asked him, quote, what colour were the sweats? Chris was actually wrong about the colour of Angie's clothes, and he never actually came up with the right answer to the question. But he was never again questioned on what type of clothes Angie had been wearing. Instead, the detectives would reinforce that Angie had been wearing sweats in every interrogation, e.g. who pulled Angie's sweats down. Another way in which the detectives manipulated Chris was to ask off-topic questions that strongly suggested an answer, such as, did you see any stuffed toys in the room? This obviously told Chris that stuffed toys had been part of the crime scene and were significant. The culpable knowledge evidence could be completely debunked, either through the methods in which the police interrogated Chris, or due to the fact that the information had been given to Chris via the police or actually published in the media prior to the interrogations taking place. The seven polygraph examinations were completely misused, with the police lying to Chris throughout and telling him that he had failed them. All of these methods were used not in an attempt to ascertain the truth, but solely to overbear Chris's will in order to coerce him into making several false confessions. And this was all despite the fact that Chris Tapp had been excluded as a suspect via DNA evidence, something which any reasonable police officer would have known proves Chris's innocence. The police just chose to ignore this. They instead manipulated Chris into giving a confession that aligns with their theory of what the case was. Not to mention that Benjamin Hobbs had also been excluded as a suspect via DNA evidence, the person who they allege had committed the crime with Chris. The police had literally no evidence to support their theory. Firstly, they coerced Chris into saying that despite not being at Angie's apartment when she was murdered, Benjamin had killed Angie and then confessed to him. But then, after realising that a witness would be more useful, they made him change his story to state that he had been at Angie's apartment with Benjamin that night and saw Benjamin attack Angie with a knife. In a later version, Chris was made to say that Benjamin had forced him to participate in the crime, so Chris had cut Angie across the chest. This version of the confession came shortly after the detectives learnt that Angie had sustained a long cut on her right breast. They kept manipulating his confession and coercing him so that his confession matched and supported their theory. On the 3rd of February 1997, a warrant of arrest was issued for Christopher Tapp. 
and he was indicted by criminal complaints with murder in the first degree and rape. The manipulation and coercion within this case is so disturbing and so detailed. If I was to explore every aspect and every way in which they forced Chris to confess, it would make this episode hours long. The trial against Christopher Tapp began on the 12th of May 1998, and the prosecutors sought the death penalty. At the trial, based on the false and fabricated evidence reported by the police officers, the prosecution gave a story that Chris Tapp, along with Benjamin Hobbs, had raped and murdered Andrew Dodge. The jury was told that Chris had confessed to participating in the crimes, and that his confession had been corroborated by the facts that he had provided multiple non-public facts. The jury was never told that each and every one of these non-public facts had been fed to Chris by the detectives prior to his confessions, but that wasn't all. A third person, a friend of both Chris's and Benjamin's, was also coerced by the detectives into giving a witness testimony. And this testimony was that she had overheard Chris and Benjamin confess to the murder at a party. This testimony was completely false. And sadly, on the 28th of May, 1998, based on all of these lies, and after 13 hours of deliberation, the jury returned guilty verdicts against Christopher Tapp on all counts. He was sentenced on the 10th of December, 1998, to life in prison, plus 15 years, and a fixed term of 30 years for the murder, and a term of 20 years with a fixed term of 10 years for rape. The craziest part in all of this was that despite Benjamin Hobbs being so key and centre in the police's theory, and that Chris Tapp had been prosecuted for a murder he had allegedly committed alongside Benjamin Hobbs, Benjamin was never prosecuted in this case, and the reality soon hit Chris of what had happened, and that he was innocent. And Chris did not stop fighting to demonstrate his innocence. He filed appeal after appeal, and had multiple unsuccessful petitions for post-conviction relief. And by the mid-2000s, after years of fighting for his innocence alone, Chris made a very unlikely ally. Angie Dodge's mother, Carol Dodge. Carol had believed that Chris had been guilty following the trial, but she decided years afterwards to sit down and watch the interrogation tapes in their entirety. And it was after watching the tapes that she realised that Chris had been manipulated and coerced. She further discovered that Chris had been excluded as a suspect via DNA evidence, and she knew right away in her heart that Chris was innocent. Carol became Chris's biggest advocate. She began to share the case files with experts in false confessions to see what she could do to help. In 2012, Carol began to speak with the judge from Judges for Justice, an organisation that reviews cases with suspected injustice. And the judge, Carol and Chris, fought hard for Chris's innocence. It's important to note that in 2001, DNA testing was conducted on semen found on Angie's body, and it revealed a partial profile for a man. This partial profile was entered into the DNA database, and it returned no matches which is a major red flag as Chris's DNA and Benjamin's DNA would have been entered into the database. In 2008, with the help of the Idaho Innocence Project, hair from the crime scene was tested for DNA and were matched to the DNA profile from the 2001 semen sample, but again returned no results when entered into the DNA database. It took until 2017 with proof that the evidence that had convicted Chris was false and with the DNA evidence, for the state to finally agree to release Chris Tapp from prison. Chris served 20 years for a crime he did not commit and was forced into confessing to. 20 years of his life that he will never get back, all at the hands of one police department. But this raised one major issue. If Chris hadn't been responsible, then that means the true perpetrator had been free and walking the streets for those 20 years and they still were. In the spring of 2018, a portion of the semen sample was submitted for genealogy testing, which revealed an expansive DNA profile. Using this through an ancestry database, the authorities were able to locate and identify third cousins of who the true attacker was. And following a genealogy investigation, it was concluded that it was highly likely the DNA belonged to a man called Brian Drips. The genealogy investigation is extremely complex and scientific and, you know, I, I'm not going to delve into detail about it because it's way, way above my understanding of uh, genealogy. Um, so let's just consider they use magic to do that, to figure that out. They definitely use magic. Brian Drips had lived across the street from Angie Dodge at the time of the murder, and this hadn't been the first time that the investigators had heard his name. In fact, within days of Angie Dodge being murdered, 
the police had actually questioned Brian Drips, and Brian admitted to the police that he'd been out and about until 3am the night that the murder had taken place, the very window of time that the crime had occurred between 12.30am and 3am, but he was too drunk to remember seeing anybody when he was out, meaning that he had nobody to corroborate his alibi. And Brian Drips had a violent reputation known to the police, but despite that, the suspicious statement and the fact that he lived across the street from Angie, the police failed to investigate him any further. If they had done so, they would have solved the murder, and Chris Tapp would have not lost 20 years of his life. Just two months after Angie's murder in June of 1996, on the 2nd of August 96, Brian left Idaho Falls. He moved away. A 1999 divorce proceeding showed that he had moved to an address in Caldwell, Idaho, and the record suggested that it was likely that he still lived there. And so a small team of detectives were sent to collect a DNA sample from him. They surveilled Brian for 24 hours straight, and at some point during the surveillance, Brian flicked a cigarette butt out of the window of a car he was driving. The investigators rushed to recover the cigarette butts, but were unsuccessful. Then on the 10th of May 2019, Brian discarded another cigarette butt out of the window of his car, which they were able to recover. This was rushed to the DNA lab to undergo comparisons, and the results quickly came back. It was a complete match. The cigarette butt was compared to DNA found in the semen and the hairs left at the crime scene, and came back positive on all of them. On the 15th of May 2019, Brian was brought in for questioning in connection to this case, and he didn't hold back. He immediately admitted his guilt. He explains that he had acted alone and that he didn't know Chris Tapp at all. He confessed to everything. Brian Drip was then charged with murder and rape. He was denied bail. Chris Tapp was fully exonerated on the 17th of July 2019, more than 22 years after he was arrested for a murder he didn't commit. He has since filed a lawsuit against several of the officers involved in his wrongful imprisonment and conviction. The lawsuit was filed in late 2020 and is pending a jury trial. On Tuesday the 9th of February 2021, Brian Drips pled guilty to all charges of first-degree murder and rape. The sentencing against Brian Drips was scheduled for April but was postponed due to him being exposed to COVID in prison. Brian Drips' sentencing hearing would then took place on the 8th of June 2021. Let's take a look. What a long, horrible journey Brian Drips has passed through for the past 25 years. The pictures that are in our mind are Angie's crime scene pictures, the way you left her. The last night I saw her, just shortly hours, Brian Drips, before he brutally killed her, she was at my house. My last words to her were, I love you. I held her in my arms. And never again did I ever get able to hold her again because of your actions, your evil actions, your selfish actions. And I can't forgive you. Ever. The family of Angie Dodge finally receives justice today. The man charged with her rape and murder was sentenced in Bonneville County Court this morning. Local News 8's Emma Iannacone tells us how this historic case came to a close. Emma? Yes, Todd, it's been nearly 25 years to the day that 18-year-old Angie Dodge was found murdered in her Idaho Falls home. Now the man responsible will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. Christopher Tapp had been wrongfully convicted of Angie's rape and murder in 1997 and spent the next 20 years in prison until investigators found that the DNA left at the crime scene matched that of Brian Drips, making this the very first exoneration in the United States that was based on familial DNA. Drips was sentenced to 20 years to life on Tuesday morning, which Angie's brothers said that falls tremendously short of what he deserves. Let Angie finally have a place at the table and not on the floor. Let her speak from the grave. Let her voice be heard about the absolute brutality she suffered that night.
Angie's family had hoped that this case would go to trial, which would put the death penalty back on the table, but that didn't happen. They reached a plea deal instead. Now, Drips is 55 years old now, and his defense team says that because of his declining health, this 20-year prison sentence is basically a death sentence. After so much pain and fighting for true justice for Angie over two decades, I hope that her family and friends can finally find the closure that they deserve. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more true crime content. I post a new video every Sunday, so make sure you hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. My social media can be found in the description and in the pinned comments down below. With all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.